Father, we love you today, and we thank you for the opportunity on this Palm Sunday to be in the house of God. I humble myself before you and before your people today. I pray, Lord, that you will teach us from your word. I don't have any desire to entertain or impress, but I do have a great desire to bring the word of God to your precious people. May the seed of the word find good soil and bring forth a hundredfold, and we celebrate today the cross of Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Well, usually I'm up there, but I've moved over here a little bit today because I wanted the cross to be central, and we're also going to be giving some illustrations of it, but I think no greater song could have been sung than the old rugged cross made the difference. I'm excited about the cross. So that's what we're going to talk about today, Michelle. We're so happy to have you here from Nashville, Tennessee. Let's welcome Michelle. She's come, and uh, we thank God that she's here. I want to talk to you today about the trials and the crucifixion of the Lord Jesus. His trials and crucifixion. On Palm Sunday, we celebrate his triumphant entry. He came riding in on a donkey. Zechariah said, your king will come unto you, meek and lowly, and riding upon a donkey. And when he came in, they shouted, Hosanna, blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. But before the week ended, they were shouting, crucify him, do away with him, and give us Barabbas. We call it the triumphant entry, and it was, but only temporary. But I have some good news. There is another triumphant entry that is coming. And when he comes back the next time, after he catches away his church, and then we return with him seven years later, he will come back, not on a donkey, but on a white charger. He will not come back to die on a cross but he will come back to rule on the throne of his father David as king of kings and lord of lords. But I want you to go back with me today, and I'm going to walk you through in remembrance the trials and the crucifixion of the Lord Jesus Christ. Something just came to my mind. I remember years ago I preached a major camp meeting for one of the district councils of the Assemblies of God. I think there was about 1,200 pastors and uh, spouses there. And I preached, Gloria, on the cross of Christ. I preached four times. Two times I preached on the cross. And uh, the district superintendent went to the presbytery later in the year and said, I really feel led of the Spirit of God to ask Mike Brown to come back and preach at our next camp meeting. And uh, one of the presbyters it always gets back to you, Ned. There's nothing secret. And one of the presbyters said, I like Brother Mike, but he just preaches on the cross too much. <laughs> well, he was overruled, and I got invited back anyway. And I heard the story that I just preach on the cross too much. So out of those four services, I preached all four of them on the cross of Jesus. Now, I don't know if that was spiritual or I was in the flesh, but the Lord anointed it anyway. How many know you can't talk about the cross too much? You can't preach about the cross too much. You can't take the cross out of Christianity and have any Christianity left. So I want us to fast forward from the triumphal entry now to the Garden of Gethsemane. In the garden when Jesus took his disciples, after they had sung a hymn, and after the new covenant in his blood was instituted. And they went and he took three, Peter, James, and John. They went a little further than the others did. And he said, watch and pray with me for one hour. And the Bible said he went forward, and the Greek says he cast himself on the ground, face down in the dust of Gethsemane. And there's several things I want you to see about the garden today. Number one, destiny was revealed in the garden. His destiny was revealed. He said this, Now is my soul troubled, and what shall I say, Father? Save me from this hour, but for this cause 
I came unto this hour. What was his destiny? You were born to live. He was born to die. You were born to enjoy a long life. He was born to live 33 years and to die in agony on a cross. And it was in the garden that, first of all, his destiny was revealed. Secondly, there had to be a decision made in the garden. The Bible said, as I mentioned a while ago, and I'm not trying to be dramatic. You could never dramatize it enough. But it, he said that um, in the Greek it says that he went and cast himself on the ground. Most of the time you'll see a picture of Jesus kneeling and a rock in front of him. He's got a glow around his head and his hands are folded in prayer. Well, it's a beautiful picture, but according to the original language, it is not an accurate depiction. The accurate depiction is more like this. Father, if it's possible, if it's possible, if it's possible, save me from this hour. If it's possible, oh God, I don't want to drink this cup. I don't want to become Mike Brown's sin. I don't want to become Karen Brown's sin. I don't want to become Ken Rensing's sin. I don't want to become Hector Buonatello's sin. I don't want to become sin. Father, let this cup pass from me. And the Bible says that he sweat as it were. Great drops of blood falling to the ground. But the last part of that prayer was, nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. I want you to get a picture of what Calvary is really like. It's not medieval Renaissance paintings as accurate as that it may have been to them in those days. It is a bloody, agonizing, pain-filled process. It did not just happen six hours on a cross. It began in the garden when the decision of all decisions had to be made. What cup did he not want to drink of? He did not want to drink this cup. He who knew no sin was made to be sin for us that we might be made the righteousness of God in Christ. I believe that he would have died in the Garden of Gethsemane if angels had not come and ministered to him. He in the garden became the totality of all of humanity's sin from the Garden of Eden, not just to his time, but all the way to the end of the age. He did not just take it upon himself. He became a murderer. He became in God's eyes an adulterer. He became, in God's eyes, a war criminal. He became, in God's eyes, all of the foul, vicious Holocaust atrocities of Adolf Hitler. Do we understand? It isn't a beautiful Renaissance painting. It's a bloody, muddy, dusty face, blood mingling in the dust as he becomes my sin. I want us to see it. I want us to understand it to the best ability we have. And our best ability is limited. There was a decision. But next, after the decision, there was a disappointment. There was a disappointment. Anybody here ever had disappointment in people? Jesus takes the three that are the closest to him. Peter, James, John, come and pray with me here just for one hour. Just watch and pray 
just for one hour. And the Bible said he came back the first time and they were asleep. And he said, hey, wake up. Couldn't you watch and pray with me for one hour? The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Watch and pray that you don't enter into temptation. And then he goes back and he falls on his face again. He sweats great drops of blood. He comes back wiping the blood from his brow. And it says in Matthew 26, 40, he comes unto the disciples and finds them asleep. I, I, I don't know about you, but I, I don't want in these last days the Lord to come to me and find me asleep. I want to be awake to what he wants. I want to be awake to what he wants from me. I want to be awake to what he's asking of me. He finds his disciples asleep, and he said unto Peter, What? Couldn't you even watch with me for one hour? He took the disappointment of all mankind upon himself. But after the disappointment in the garden, there was something else. There was a display. There was a display. John 18, 4 through 6, Jesus, knowing all things that should come upon him, went forth and said unto them, Whom seek ye? By this time the mob had come. The soldiers were there. And the Lord says, who are you looking for? And they answered him, we're looking for Jesus of Nazareth. And Jesus said unto them, now the King James says, I am he. But the original just says, he said, I am. And if you know anything about your Bible in the Old Testament, God introduced himself to Moses. He said, I am that I am. And here's an entire mob, soldiers, ready to take him away. And I want you to see the display. They said, well, who are you looking for? Jesus of Nazareth. And he said unto them, I am. And Judas also, which betrayed, stood with them. And soon as he had said that unto them, I am, they all fell backwards on the ground. This is not the meek little Jesus lying in a manger. Y'all get the point here. He is not having his life taken from him. And he wants them to know it. He says, who are you looking for? Jesus. I am. And they all fell backwards on the ground. Now, I've heard of being slain under the power is a blessing. But this was not a blessing. He was wanting them to know who he was. You know what he literally did? It was as if his glory, his divinity, was clothed in flesh. Because he was a human. And when they said, we're looking for Jesus of Nazareth. All he did was kind of take his flesh, symbolically, not literally, but symbolically. And he kind of let a little of his glory out. <laughs> Just a little bit. He just said... Who are you looking for? Jesus of Nazareth. And he went there. He said this. I am. <laughs> Come on, did you see it? It was about that long. I am. I am. I want to get every section. I am. I am. Now if he'd have done this. I am. Everybody had died. He was the incarnate Son of God. And he wanted them to know, no man takes my life from me. I lay it down willingly. And if I have power to lay it down three days later, I have power to pick it up again. And he showed it. That's why I've never been ashamed as a man to follow Jesus. He knew who he was. Yes, he went meekly as a lamb to the slaughter for us. But before he became the lamb and the slaughter, he roared once. <laughs> he showed him a little bit of the lion of the tribe of Judah. Anybody in the house grateful that we serve a mighty God? And not only was that a display, but Peter whipped out his sword. He was a little bit like Quintus Maximus. 
Now, if you're a guest today, you don't have any idea what I'm talking about, but I, we've been talking about the armor of God, you know, and Quintus Maximus uh, looks more like, uh, let me see, who was the guy that always, come on, Quintus, stand up on your feet. Woo, Quintus has had an upgrade. He's not, an, that's enough, son, set out. <laughs> but Quintus carried a sword, you know. And uh, Peter carried a sword. And just a few hours before this event, Jesus said, Peter, you're going to deny me three times. And he said, not me, Lord. Everybody else may. Everybody else may run away. Everybody else may deny. But not me. But remember what Jesus said in the garden. Your spirit is willing, but your flesh is weak. And when it came down to it, he was still willing. And he whips out the sword and goes for Malchus's head. I hear people said, boy, he was sure good with that knife. He cut his ear off. He wasn't going for his ear. He missed. He was going to subdivide. He was willing to give his life at that point. But the ear came off, and Jesus said, put away your sword. They that live by the sword shall die by the sword. And he reaches down, picks up the ear. Puts it back on Malchus and instantly heals him. He displays who he is and he displays what he can do. They take him from that time and they lead him away to the trials. You must understand how that they led Jesus. And I've made a study of this. They led Jesus and they tied victims and prisoners in a very unusual way. They tied them with their hands this way, pulled up between their shoulder blades, and tied very tightly. Then they tied a rope around their neck, and then tied it around their waist so when they walked like this, of Jesus already having become sin, leaving the garden. This is the picture of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. This is the picture of the one to whom angels had bowed to through the ceaseless ages of eternity. But now, So I have no problem bowing at his feet. I said I have no problem bowing at his feet. He willingly allows them to lead them away. The trials are in this order. They took him first to the high priest, Caiaphas and Annas, then to the Sanhedrin, then to Pilate. Pilate wanted nothing to do with him, so he sent him to Herod. Herod mocked him and sent him back to Pilate. Every one of the trials were illegal. The high priest, the Sanhedrin, Pilate, Herod, and Pilate. Several things happened. First of all, the degradation began. The degradation began. Luke 22. And the men that held Jesus mocked him and smote him. And when they had blindfolded him, they struck him on the face and asked him, saying, Prophesy, who is it that smote thee? And many other blasphemous things they spake against him. I think the passion of the Christ, as far as the movie, comes the closest possibly to depicting what it was really like. But you cannot really depict it. Isaiah said his visage or his face, was marred beyond recognition of that of a human being. The first degradation, humiliation took place. They blindfolded him. 
And I want you to get the picture. He's standing like this, blindfolded, and the soldiers would walk up. Who smote you? Who hit your prophet? Come on, prophet. Prophesy. Who was it? Come on, prophet. Brother Mike, don't be so dramatic. Yeah, I think it's time. We've encrusted the cross in silver and gold and precious stones, and there's nothing wrong with that because it honors what the Lord did. But can I remind you that this was the Creator being humiliated by His creation. It was the Creator going through things. And, I, and I've made an exhaustive study about the trials, an exhaustive study about the cross, and there are things that Rome and even the Israeli guards did that I would not even make mention of in a church service. Some of the most cruel, brutal people, and I believe that many that were humiliating Christ were probably demon-possessed. The Bible said that when Judas kissed him, Satan had entered into him. Meaning what? He was not demon-possessed. He was Satan-possessed. Who hit you? Prophet? Come on, prophet! And then one would reach out and grab a portion of his beard, rip it from his face. This is the kind of preaching that got my reputation in that district of preaching too much on the cross. Well, I'm still doing it. I think the story needs to be told accurately. Blood is flowing from where his beard was. His shoulders very well by now may have been out of joint. The Bible said my bones are out of joint. None of them were broken, but out of joint. They're hitting him in the face. Taking fist, hitting him in the face. Eyes swelling shut. Degradation. Humiliation. This is what the cross is. It's not a pretty thing. It's a beautiful thing. I don't know if you got what I just said. It's not a pretty thing, but it's a beautiful thing. It's beautiful what he did for us. It's beautiful what he did for us. I think of the old song that says, I was guilty with nothing to say, and they were coming to take me away, but a voice from heaven was heard, and it said, Let them go and take me instead. I should have been crucified. I should have suffered and died. I should have hung on the cross in disgrace. But Jesus, God's Son, took my place. Are anybody happy that you don't have to go through the degradation of it? That he took the degradation of it. Declarations were made during the trials. You all still with me? Declarations were made. They asked him, are you the Christ? Tell us. And he said unto them, if I tell you, you'll not believe me. And if I also ask you, you will not answer me, nor let me go. And then notice what he said. But hereafter shall the Son of Man sit on the right hand of the power of God. And they said, art thou then the Son of God? And he said unto them, you say that I am. And they said, what need have we any further of witnesses? For we ourselves have heard it of his own mouth. He did not shrink back from declaring who he was. He said, and, and people try to say, well, he never said he was the son of God. He did. You ever heard people say, say something to you and you look back and, and say this? You said it. You said it. That's what he was doing. He said, yeah. And not only that, you're going to see me as the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of God's glory and coming in the clouds of heaven. 
And I got some news. Just as sure as he got up on the third day, he is seated at the right hand of God's glory. And for those that know the Lord, we are seated with Christ in heavenly places. And some glad morning, when this life is o'er, he's going to come again. And we're going to uh, rise to meet him in the sky. So it's not a pretty thing, but it's a beautiful thing. Oh, I love that. That ought to go on a t-shirt. Tammy. She's around here doing things, I know. Tammy, that ought to go on a t-shirt. I picture it with a cross. And I'll be right back with the rest of you. I'm giving instructions to my staff. See it on the, and I picture it with a cross and say the cross wasn't a pretty thing. There she is. What a, <laughs> she gave me a thumbs up. How many pray for Tammy on a weekly basis? And, and, and April and Doug and Becky, you know, pray, pray, pray. But, ah, oh, I'd wear that T-shirt, wouldn't you? It wasn't a pretty thing, but it was a beautiful thing. And then after that, there was a debate. I'm just walking you through this. Y'all still with me? There was a debate. John 18, 33 through 37. Pilate entered into the judgment hall again. Now he's before Pilate. And called Jesus and said unto him, Are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus answered him and said, Do you say this thing of yourself, or did others tell it of you? I want to tell you something, man. We have got a good lawyer. If you'll study the way Jesus dealt in this trial, he made them all look foolish. He said, uh, Did you say this of yourself, or did others tell you? And Pilate said, Am I a Jew? Your own nation and the chief priests have delivered you unto me. What have you done? And Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then my servants would fight, and I would not be delivered to the Jews. But now my kingdom is not from hence. And Pilate therefore said unto him, Are you a king then? And Jesus said, You said I'm a king. To this end was I born, and for this cause came I into the world, that I should bear witness of the truth. And everyone that is of the truth Heareth my voice. And then it went on, and Pilate said, What is truth? And philosophers have been trying to figure that out ever since. What is truth? Let me answer the question for you. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. You know the story that Pilate's wife discerned and had a dream. And she told Pilate, have nothing to do with this good man. So Pilate thought he would hand him off. He sent him to Herod. Oh, he's a Galilean. He sent him to Herod. Herod mocked him more. In, a, in Herod's mockery, they took a purple robe that is usually meant to be a beautiful thing. And with that purple robe, they threw it around the shoulders of Jesus. Took a crown of thorns later. And we have a crown of thorns. The ones that uh, were used was far bigger than this. Took the crown of thorns and the purple robe. Because after all, he said he was a king. And they took the crown of thorns. Botanists say that there were two kinds of thorns, or actually three in Israel at that time. And the ones most probably used were two to four inches in length. The closest we would have to them would be the locust thorns that you'll see on locust trees here in the Ozark. Long thorns. And the Bible said they took the crown of thorns and didn't lightly put it on his head. The, the word is they planted it on his head. I want you to get the picture. Old vomit-stained purple robe from one of their orgies in the palace. Hung around his bleeding neck and bleeding face. Half his beard or a quarter or a third ripped away. He's already been beat up by Herod's soldiers. Now they take a crown of thorns and put it on his head. 
to where it goes through the epidermic layer of the skin and grates against the skull cap. Scientists tell us, botanists tell us that if those thorns were used, and they most probably were, that they secreted a substance that when it came in contact with the blood system would cause the skin to swell two to four times its normal size. That's why Isaiah said his face did not look like that of a man. I want you to get the picture. Brother Mike, don't describe it so vividly. I'm telling you, the whole world needs to hear this story. I said the whole world needs to hear this story. Religious leaders have come and gone, but there was one who came and took my sin and took my humiliation and took my crown of thorns uh, and took my mockery and shed his blood and laid down his life and came back from the grave. And he says, whosoever will, let him come and drink of the waters of life freely. And then they would take a stick, and I don't have one up here, but they took a stick and they would beat the crown of thorns down upon his head. And this was a common practice. Jesus was not only one to wear a crown of thorns. They would do this often. But they mocked him particularly as king of the Jews. And they beat the crown of thorns down into his head. Degradation. Humiliation. Pilate sees him again. And says, what harm has he done? I don't find anything wrong that this man has done. He said, I'm going to let him go. And they said, no, you cannot let him go. Crucify him. And so he thought he would appease the crowd. And he said, I tell you what I'll do. I'll compromise. How many know there's no compromise about Jesus? You either believe on him or you don't. And Pilate said, I'll compromise with the crowd. And he said, I'll have him flogged. A cat of nine tails was used to flog the Lord Jesus. This is a very accurate depiction of a cat of nine tails. Nine long leather strips, and on the end of each is a ball of metal with a sharp point. This is a cat of nine tails. Usually when Romans would flog their victims with such a cat of nine tails, two centurions with two cat of nine tails would flog the victim. And if you can imagine the cross now, it wasn't the whipping post. There was a whipping post. But if you can imagine the cross now as the whipping post, the victim would be stripped usually naked for further humiliation. His hands would be tied above him. He would be spread eagle like this. And one guard would stand on this side and another on this side at a 45 degree angle. I don't have room to do that up here, but at a 45 degree angle. So when one went around... As soon as it was removed, the other would go around. So there was no let up in the beating. If one centurion did it, one centurion, he'd have to bring it back. But if two did, if one did, it would be like this. But if two did, it would be. We'll live. Jesus went through that. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And by his stripes, 
we are healed. By his stripes. You understand the whipping was not just a physical whipping. It was at the whipping post in the garden he became our sin. But at the whipping post, every sickness known to man was inflicted into his body. Cerebral palsy was inflicted into his body. AIDS was inflicted into his body. Muscular dystrophy. Cancer. Every COVID-19. The bubonic plague. Every one of them was inflicted by these stripes. It was not uncommon for the victims of such a flogging to die at the whipping post. Because you see these leather straps with the metal would go all the way around. And if you could see this cross up here, you'd see the indentations that I made. would go all the way around. So it would not just be on the back, but it would come around and then in the front. And then it would come from the other side around in the front. So three quarters to all of his body on his torso would be ripped open. It's not pretty, but it's beautiful. I've never said that in my life. I just, it hit me when I was talking. It's not pretty, but it's beautiful what he did. They throw the robe he wore back on him. And he walks up the Via Della Rosa, the walk of pain. They take a cross beam, usually just the cross beam. Sometimes he would carry the vertical and the horizontal, but usually just the cross beam. And historians tell us that it would weigh between 110 to 120 pounds. This is a man that has been beaten by Herod's guards beaten by the Sanhedrin's guards, beaten by Roman legionnaires, whipped to almost unconsciousness, and he has enough strength to carry a crossbeam. How many know he's not just the son of God, but he's a man's man? And he carries that crossbeam. Come on, get the picture. Mocking. Laughing until he could carry it no more. And they found a man, Simon of Cyrene, and compelled him to take the cross. They led him up to Mount Calvary, the place of the skull. It's just outside the city gates. It is by most people picture it up on a hill, but most historians that are the most accurate would say it is at the foot of that hill, but it's right where the way goes by or the road goes by. In other words, those that passed by. You remember it says those that passed by wagged their heads and laughed at him. They crucified him there. Crucifixion is one of the most brutal, brutal deaths a man can die. Spikes were taken and put into the flesh of Jesus. Most of the time, we picture it being in the palm of his hand. But they crucified them where it went in the hollow of his wrist. You crucify here, you break bones. There was no bone broken. And we know from historical accuracy that when they crucified, and the wrist is part of the hand, so... They were able to go between the two bones. There's two strong bones. This will not hold a man on a cross. This will. They would put them in his wrist and in between the heel bone and the Achilles tendon on his foot. Take a hammer and nail the nails. into his hands. 
They would then take his feet and push them outward. And between the Achilles tendon and the heel bone, they would place another nail that would go through both. And again, they would then lift him up and put the cross beam on the vertical beam. And he would yank down on it. And when you hang on a cross, and I've studied the medical implications of the cross. When you hang on a cross, you hang suspended as such. Let me show you. You hang this way, and all of your weight compresses your lungs. And in order to breathe, you must push with your legs, pull with your hand, your arms, your back muscles. And when you can't hold yourself up anymore, Six hours. Six hours. Doctors tell us that after the second hour a man hung on a cross, that the mucous membrane on his interior of his eyelids, inside of his nose, inside of his mouth, down his throat, begins to dry up to the consistency of sandpaper. So if you open and close your eyes, it adheres to the eyeball. If you try to swallow, there's nothing left to swallow. And it's like sandpaper inside. No wonder the Lord said, when you take communion, remember. 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 God, thank you for the young composers that we have today writing songs. And I love a lot of their music, and they're doing a good job, and I think they're in their prayer closets more than they used to be. Come on, somebody. And I'm grateful. I'm grateful for that. But God, give us more composers that will write some music about the cross again and the blood of Jesus. We need more blood songs. I said we need more blood songs. I'm not ashamed of the blood of Calvary. I'm not ashamed of the cross. He hangs there, rising and falling for six hours. And let me express to you what he said. First statement. Father. Forgive them. They know not what they do. No word of cursing. No word of judgment. No word of destruction. A word of forgiveness. Father, forgive them. So why is it so hard? For us to get over what somebody said. <laughs> they haven't platted a crown of thorns on your head. They haven't put nails in our hands. Folks, the Bible says we ought to forgive one another even as God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven us. Yeah. Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. He continues to rise and fall in agony. And a thief to his left or right, we don't know which. But one of the thieves said, If you're the Son of God, come down out of this cross. Save yourself and us. But the other thief found out it's never too late. 
He changed that thief's book in the last chapter. He had written a life of rebellion and sin and anger and hatred and prejudice and murder and thievery. But in the last chapter, that's why I'm telling you, if you're here today, it doesn't mean it is where you've gone and what you've done and where you've been and how bad you think you are. And those of you watching me, it doesn't make any difference. You may think that you've gone too far away, that you've, you've been too wrong, you've been too dirty, you've sinned too much. I got some news. If that thief could get in, anybody can get in. Even at the last minute, you can get in. And he's hanging there. And he looks over at Jesus and he says, he looks the other thief first and he says, he said, we're guilty. That's the first place you come when you come to Christ. I'm guilty, Lord. He said, we deserve this. We have earned this penalty. We're guilty. But this man's done nothing wrong. And he doesn't even think he's worthy enough for God to forgive him. He doesn't even ask for forgiveness. He just asked to be remembered. He says, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And I love these words. This day. This day. All those other days are gone. It's a new day. This day. You will be with me in paradise. See. You, you, you don't have to have a lot of qualifications and a lot of certification and a lot of religious things to get into heaven. You just got to be with him. Come on, anybody understand? I, I get to go to the Blackwood show quite a bit, and I never ask this, and, and, but they're always so gracious. And I get that. I go on the front, I'm on the front row every time. You know why? Because I'm with them. Come on, somebody. I'm, I'm with them. And the real reason is R.W. wants to come down and stick a microphone. In my That's why I had to leave. I had an emergency call. I went Thursday. We had an emergency call, and I had to leave. And they were up singing. You're on the only spotlights on them. And, and you were doing turn your radio on, weren't you? And he always comes down and puts a microphone in front of me and wants me to stand up and sing a phrase or two. And he came down, and he's going like this. And Karen said, I was just so hoping he wouldn't put that microphone in front of me. <laughs> but, but I get to enjoy that on that front row. Why? I'm with them. I, I don't deserve to be on the front row. But I'm with them. I don't deserve to have that prime seat. But I'm with them. I don't deserve to be up there. But I'm with them. I don't deserve to get to sing, but I'm with them. It's not my worthiness. Oh, come on, somebody. And can you imagine that day as the thief later died or after Jesus, and he walks up to the gates of paradise, and, and somebody may have said, what right do you have to be here? You've been a thief all your life. You've been nothing but cruel. You've abandoned people you love. What right do you have? To be here. And Jesus has already got there. And a voice from inside says, leave him alone. He's with me. Excuse me. Just a moment. Just a moment. Glory to God. Hallelujah. If you're not going to shout about that, I'm going to. Hallelujah. He's with me. Not my, my might. Not by my worthiness. I'll, I'll get to the end of this in a minute. But I feel like shouting a little bit right now. I'm with him, baby. I may not be perfect, but I'm with him. I may have failed in my life, but I'm with him. I may not have meet the, uh, the standard, but I'm with him. And friend, you don't need all the religious mumbo jumbo. You just need to know Jesus. And when you're with him, don't worry, the Pharisees weren't there. We, oh, I could feel honorary right now. The ones that crucified him weren't with him. It was the thief that was with him. This day you'll be with me in paradise. 
he keeps rising and falling, and he looks down, and he sees his mom standing at the foot of his cross next to John, the only apostle, one apostle, goes to the cross with him. And he sees his mother, and he calls her woman, not mother. Woman. Woman. Now, that's not a term of, of despite or a term of rejection. Woman. Woman. Behold thy son. And he's not talking about himself. He's talking about John. And he says, John, behold your mother. And here's a little something I want you to see. The Bible says from that very hour, G John took his mother, Jesus' mother, to his own house. From that hour, that moment. You know why Jesus did that? Doug, go on up if you would. You know why Jesus did that? There was one person on the hill that tempted his flesh in coming off that cross. And when he looked down and saw his brokenhearted mother weeping at the foot of his cross, something in his flesh says, don't let your mother's heart be broken watching this anymore. You can come down off this cross. So you know what he did? Here's what he did in plain Ozark English. John, get her off this hill. Take her off this hill. Take care of her from now on. But get her off this hill. I don't want her to see this. And I don't want to watch her broken heart. It's the only thing up here that tempts me to come off this cross. So he dismissed his mother. He hangs on the cross a little longer. Then the Bible says, as it began to be dark, and as the wind began to blow, he screams out, My God! My God! Why have you forsaken me? The most brutal moment of the cross was not the whipping post. It was not the crown of thorns. It was not the nails. It was not the dehydration. It was not the internal hemorrhaging. It was not the respiratory distress. But the most uh, brutal moment of the cross was when a holy God that had been in relationship with his son forever did this and turned his back. Why? Because a holy God cannot bear sin. And he turned his back on him. He cut off the fellowship. Now it wasn't permanent because in a few minutes he's going to call him father again. But there had to be a moment of hell on earth. Hell is when you have no opportunity to fellowship with God. There is a literal hell as well. But he endured a separation from his father. And he didn't call him father. My God, my God. Why have you forsaken me? And then finally, I thirst. And the Bible said they took a reed and a sponge on it. And they dipped it in a concoction. And they offered it to Jesus. And the scriptures talk about he rejected it. He tasted it, but when he saw what it was, he rejected it. Why? If you do study, most scholars believe that it was a mixture of sour wine vinegar and an opiate that not only would dull pain, but that would cause hallucinations. And if he would have taken it and swooned under its effect, 
they could have said, oh, he just swooned. He didn't really die. He rejected anything on the cross that said he was not going to pay the whole price. And then finally, the Bible said, this is the triumph of the cross. He pulls himself up and he says this, it is finished. It is finished. What was finished? The payment for Mike Brown's sin. The payment for your sin. It wasn't half paid. It was finished. It was totally paid. It was totally ended. I think I may have told you this before, but in the Old Testament on the Day of Atonement, y'all still here? I'm not born yet, am I? They would take a goat and lay their hands on the goat and confess the sin of Israel over the goat. And then a priest would take the goat into the wilderness bearing the sin symbolically and hand him off to another priest and that priest would take him farther into the wilderness. Hand him off to another priest and that one would take him farther and another until another took him so far out in the wilderness that he could never find his way back. When he got him there, that one priest would turn around and yell back, it is finished. And the other priest would hear that and turn toward the camp. It is finished. And the next priest, it is finished. Until it reached Aaron in the tabernacle. And when Aaron heard, it is finished, he'd raise his hands over the congregation and say, your sins have been atoned for. And when Jesus hung on that cross, he took our sins as far as the east is from the west, never to be remembered. And Peter said on the day of Pentecost, it is finished. And Paul picked it up later, it is finished. And the apostles preached it, it is finished. And Billy Sunday preached it, it is finished. And D.L. Moody preached it, it is finished. And Gary McSpadden preached it, it is finished. And Mike Brown is preaching it today. It is finished. Hallelujah. And you don't have to bear your sin. It's been paid for in full. It is finished. And one more thing he said on Calvary that day. The Bible said he slumped and right before he dies, he pulls himself up and he says, Father, because when the sacrifice is finished, you come back into fellowship. Father, into your hands, I commend my spirit. And the author of life slumps and dies. And the enemy may have thought, boy, this has been a good day. It's the worst day he ever had on the earth. Because the Bible said when he slumped and died that the veil in the temple was torn in two from the top to the bottom. I said from the top to the bottom. It, it wasn't man doing it from the bottom to the top. It was God doing it from the top to the bottom. And he threw the veil open. And he said nobody has been able to come in here but the high priest once a year. But now... We'll put it in Ozark language. Y'all come. Y'all come. Y'all come. There's no barrier between God and man. There's no barrier. You can come. All you have to do is come. And if you'll confess I'm Lord, and if you'll ask me to be your Savior, y'all come. Come on in and sit down here beside me at the right hand of my Father. Uh, some more things happen, but next week I'll tell you about them. But the Bible said when he died, the earth shook. The sun refused to shine. And get this, many that were in the graves came alive. But they didn't come out of the graves till he got out of the grave. Don't you know they were impatient? Waited three days. Come on. But the Bible said they came out. So I've tried to take you on a little walk today. 
Just a little walk. Just a little walk. Still preaching the cross. Still preaching the cross. My friend, I don't care who you are or where you are and what you've done or what you haven't done. You may have been like me and sat on a church pew your whole life, but all of us have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And there's none of us righteous without Him. No, not one of us. And the Lord doesn't want to just keep you out of hell. He wants to have a relationship with you, man. I mean, you can have a relationship with this Jesus because He's not hanging on that cross anymore. And He's not a smoldering corpse in a tomb. He's alive. He's well. He's vital. He's involved. He's interested in your life. And so... One more time. I would say I'm sorry that the cross affects me this way. But I'm not. When it stops affecting me this way, Carol, I'll get out. I don't ever need to preach again. If I can't preach about the cross with tears in my eyes and a realization that I am what I am by the grace of God. And nothing else. You're healed of cancer because of the cross. I hear you know, standing feet. She shouldn't even be here, but she's healed of cancer because of the cross of Calvary. You say, but Brother Mike, what about people that go on home? They are too. Whether it's here or there. The cross has made the difference. The cross has made the difference. So I'm going to let you go in a few minutes. But if you listen to a little preacher of the cross today, nothing else you can ever do will give you life. Nothing else you will ever do will bring you into fellowship with God. He's already done it. All you have to do is accept it and follow Him. Come on, slip your hand up and give Him praise for the cross. Come on, just give Him praise for the cross. Thank you, Lord. 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 Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I want every head bowed, every eye closed. Those of you watching online, I'm speaking to you as well today. I don't know how long the Lord will let me continue to preach the gospel of the cross. I've asked Him to let me have decades more. That's up to Him. But I've spent my adult life traveling around the world telling you, He died for you. He died for you. And whether you're online or in the house today, I'd be a fool if I'd walk away from this message and not give you an opportunity to know that you're right with God through Jesus. While no one's looking around, I want people to look at your heart. I want you to look at your heart. I'm not talking about water baptism. I'm not talking about being good. I'm not talking about church membership. I'm not talking about good works and giving to the poor. I'm talking about have you accepted Christ as your personal Savior? And if you have, are you walking with Him? Or maybe you once did, but you've walked away from the Lord. And before we go in the final prayer, you'd say, Pastor Mike, pray for me today. I'm not sure I'm right with God, and I want to be sure. I want to know I'm right with God. If you're like that all over the building, and if you're watching online, you can raise your hand where you are. Just slip your hand up high right now in Jesus' name. Yes, I saw that. Yes, I saw that. Anybody else? Anybody else? Those of you watching online, you say, Pastor, I'm not there, so it won't work. Oh, yes, it'll work right where you are, right where you are. 
The word says, whosoever will, let him come. Let him come. Let him come. And that's what I'm doing. I'm letting you come. I can't see your hand being raised, but you go ahead right where you are. Just raise it up to the Lord, and he'll see where you are. We're going to pray a prayer in a moment. Anybody else in the house? I'm looking. A couple have raised their hands. Anybody else? Anybody else? I'm not sure I'm right. Yes, 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 yes. I see it. God bless you. I see it, but you can put it down. I see it. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. I'm going to ask one more thing as the Holy Spirit leads me. I'm profoundly moved by this service today. I can tell you I'm profoundly moved. There are some of you here and you know the Lord, but you're not really walking in fellowship with Him. It's not a matter that you're in rebellion, but there's just no real communication. There's not a close fellowship the way you want it to be. And all of us have been there. And you'd say, Brother Mike, this Easter season, I want there to be a closeness between me and Jesus. I want to have a real fellowship with the Lord like I've never had. If you're like that, slip your hand up right now in Jesus' name. Put it back down. Yes, God bless you. Yes, I see it. Yes, yes, I saw it back there. Yes, yes, I see it on the back. God bless you. Anybody else? Anybody else? Yes, God bless you. God bless you. Yes, ma'am. Praise the Lord. God will do that for you. He'll do that for you. If you raised your hand in either one of those areas, you're coming to the Lord, you're coming back, or you know the Lord, but you just want to have a closer fellowship, just stand to your feet right now. If you raise your hand, stand to your feet right now. All over the building. All over the building. And I want to pray with you. Here's what I want you to do. I want, I want you to come and let me pray right here. Would you come? Step out and come. Come on. Come on. Just come from where you are. Say, excuse me, please. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Just come on up. I'm going to pray for you. I'm going to pray for you today. Praise God. Come on, young man. Praise God. Come on, young man. We're going to pray with you. Praise God. There's two or three others. Come on. I'm waiting for you. Brother Mike, I don't want to go up in front of people. Well, he didn't want to hang naked on a cross for six hours, but he did in front of people. And he said, if you'll acknowledge me before man, I'll acknowledge you. But if you deny me, I'll deny you. So if you raise your hand, just come on. Say, well, Brother Mike, I didn't raise my hand, but I need to be up there. Well, come on. Come on. Come on. And I'll pray for you. Come on, young man. Let me pray for you. That's it, buddy. Come on. Yeah, come on. <laughs> Hallelujah. My pleasure to pray for young men like this. Praise God. Wow, what a great family. Great family. Greatest honor of my life has been able to pray with people like you. Some of you may be the first time that you've come to Christ. Others of you know the Lord. But you just want to have a close fellowship with Him. And the Bible says, if we'll confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus, just meaning you're Lord of my life, you're Lord of my life, and you believe in your heart that God raised Him on that third day. We'll talk about that next Sunday. Raised Him on the third day. He said you'll be saved the greatest time in your life but he doesn't want to just forgive you he wants you to have a life walking with him you know what I've discovered I've got bored with a lot of people I've got bored with myself quite frequently but I've never been bored with him and when you really know him and walk with him and talk with him it's life transforming I want to pray with you today you may have prayed this prayer before, but I want to pray the prayer with you. And then I want to pray for you. And if you'll mean it from your heart today, God will give you a new beginning. Those of you that know the Lord, a new fellowship will begin, man. New fellowship, pal. So glad you're a part of us. Pray this prayer with me out loud. Would you do it right after me? Dear God in heaven, I come to you just as I am. 
I realize you died for me. I accept that. I ask you for your mercy and your grace. Right now, I confess that you are Lord over my life. I believe you have risen from the dead. I accept you now as my Lord and Savior. I thank you for your grace and your mercy. I receive it all because you finished the work that needed to be done. In Jesus' name.